All right, today we have a very special guest. He has led a variety of projects across different countries and and this is mainly for agencies that I know of, thing, agencies like Publis, Emil, and as well as TMX in Malaysia and across different countries, mainly for Mercedes-Benz. And we brought him on board to give us a better understanding on how to best deliver or manage product, projects across uh, different countries and across different teams. So without further hesitation, let me introduce you to Yuhan. Welcome to the Wow Factor podcast. Thank you very much, Samuel, for the introduction. So that's great. How has been your day or has been, how has been your week so far? It's been quite crazy. I think we're just wrapping up a lot of things. Uh, it's the end of the year. I'm supposed to be preparing for the next year as well. I myself, like, I can't wait for my break. So that's been <laughs> that's been something going on for me. But yes, the year end season, I think everybody is just trying to wind down and move on. Right. I can guess you're ready for the holidays already. Of course, yeah. I got quite an agenda packed for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. That's good to hear. So as we kick this off, uh, the audience would really want to know who Johan is. Probably give us a brief introduction and let's get it cracking. Yep, of course, yeah. Um, if anybody who's not heard Samuel in this introduction, my name is Johan. Uh, you can just call me Johan. I go by Johan uh, as my name. Uh, I'm currently the experience director in RAP in Malaysia. So RAP Worldwide Malaysia is a global network agency. So we have the Mercedes-Benz account of us. So that's been a result of uh, the pitch since one and a half years ago now. And we've been consolidating all of the efforts for Mercedes-Benz in terms of the digital marketing. So in RAP Malaysia, I act as the experience uh, director. And on the TMX region overseas, I do have capacity as a program delivery lead. So a lot of my function is helping to manage the specialist program across the different work streams that we have across the different verticals, um, mainly around website management, personalization, and as well as CRM uh, communication programs that we used to build out for Mercedes-Benz and all of their local markets uh, on a regional level. So that's really what I do in work on a very high level. Um, outside of work, I read quite a bit and, you know, as close as Samuel is a big fan of documentaries, I myself am one as well, although I haven't really had the chance to catch up on a lot of it, but I read a lot, uh, you know, I watch a lot of uh, documentaries and not exactly what people call as a fun person, quite boring in that, uh, in that aspect of things, but that's really what I like doing. I like doing a lot of uh, or sort of absorbing a lot of knowledge around analysis and as well as, um, you know, really understanding why or how something happens. So those are the areas that really interest me across any sort of area or across any sort of topic. I just like digging into the why and how's. So that's me in a nutshell. Interesting. So what, what kind of books do you read? Uh, what kind of documentaries do you watch? In terms of books, I actually have a wide array, uh, array of them. I think my favorite has been history. So really, um, it's, it's not really in-depth history, I would say. I don't, I don't really dig into rabbit holes, but I, I like reading a lot of generic histories, just understanding how different authors sort of look at history and, and sort of synthesize their findings. Because one of the things that, one of the patterns that you realize is it's very hard for you to summarize, um, you know, summarize a lot of the things that has actually happened throughout the centuries that has already been before us. So a lot of the authors actually like using a lot of storytelling elements to it. And one of the few things that they actually do is that when they try to pull the red thread across all of the things, uh, they would try to set up, look at it from certain aspect. So some of them, they'll look at it from a cultural aspect, some of them will look at it from a geographical aspect. It's very sort of interesting and actually as well, it's, it's, it's just, just really interesting to see how people sort of find and connect the dots together across the areas that they specialize in. So understanding how geographical changes in terms of the landscape, in terms of the economy actually affects uh, certain civilizations in place or understanding, you know, how culture and the mixing of culture and as well as uh, assimilation of culture has actually helped to sort of, you know, accelerate or sometimes de-accelerate certain growths within certain areas and populations as well. So looking into those different aspects of things has been quite interesting. I haven't been able to read a lot lately, so I couldn't actually remember the last book that I picked up. 
because uh, it's been quite a while. But I think, uh, you know, over the coming weeks, that's something that I would like to focus on. Right? Wow, that's good to hear. So as we're in the topic of reading and studying and all, would you say that the schools that you went to had a strategic impact to uh, the current career that you're in? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think, yes. Um, in all of the interviews that I go through, a lot of it's really just job interviews, trying to introduce myself. Uh, and so I know if you haven't heard this, this, if this is the first time you're hearing it, then I guess it's really good, right? So I get to tell the story again. Uh, but I didn't actually start off in marketing technology. Uh, that's what I'm doing now. I actually started off as a PR practitioner. So I did public relations uh, when I was in my bachelor's degree. Then I actually moved on to do my master's, which I completed three years ago uh, in a school called Hyper Island. So a lot of the people that actually know, so like they will sort of compare Hyper Island as the Harvard of digital schools, right? And back then they were very specialized in the digital space. There was only two courses that they actually offered, which is the digital management as well as digital experience, digital experience design, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's specifically how they named it. So it would, this, if you sort of wind back and think about the landscape in about three years ago, so being a specialization in user experience is actually quite hard to find. So a lot of the sort of namesakes or a lot of the, uh, you know, the incumbents of educational institution, but they do not specifically have a program that specializes in digitalization or in the aspect of area of digital marketing, sort of in marketing technology or user experience sort of sense, right? A lot of them are very much traditional. You have your business, econs, you have your finance, you have marketing, but really much, very much in the traditional marketing space. So uh, Harbor Island was trying to do something different. They were trying to sort of disrupt the industry with the offerings that they had. Uh, and I found it really interesting because I was recommended by my ECD at a point of time. So I went on, packed my bags, went to the UK, so, you know, went there for about a year, completed my studies and whatever not. Uh, and then here I am, right? Uh, not a lot of the things that I'm doing today and sort of the solutions uh, and ideas really rooted from the fact that, you know, I've been exposed to Hyper Island, their programs, the people, and as well as a lot of the exchanges that I actually had there. So um, it's, you know, it's probably one of the best moves that I made uh, throughout my entire life. So that's how I would put it. Interesting. At least you see that at least there's a good correlation between what you studied and and where you are right now in your career. So as we go deeper into uh, project management at a, at a global level, what would you define as the, the 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 perspective what what would you define as as effective global project management so to me project management uh if we talk about the essence of project management it's really just two things that we're striving for the first thing is effectiveness and the second thing is really efficiency right whatever i think a lot of the sort of incremental changes or improvements that we actually do in terms of our day-to-day -day and even above and beyond our day-to-day -day, when i was sort of trying to look for solutions that would actually help our workflow if we're you know sort of trying to find solutions for the team to actually work better more cohesively uh and as well as working with different stakeholders as well but the key the key areas and sort of the key pivot uh pivots that we actually need to look at are really just how could i make this entire thing more efficient and how could i actually make it more effective for the people that i'm working uh, with or the things that i'm working uh working on right so these are sort of the two core principles that i i if i effectively just look at um and that's sort of guided how i sort of strategize around the solutions that are deployed from a project management perspective. So if we sort of bring this onto the context that we have today, working in, working with Mercedes-Benz, right? Working in TMAX, working with Mercedes-Benz, um, that's really sort of the, that, that should be the acting principle for us as well because there's so many things, there's so many sort of moving factors and dependencies working on such a global and uh, such a huge and global team. There's too many things that you can't actually control there's too many sort of, uh, you know, environments that you don't have a lot of influence over and just holding, holding through to two core ideas or two core principles uh, really sort of helps you stabilize and helps you sort of pivot your ways of working uh, and as well as your team's ways of working. Like that's uh, how I believe it to be. 
so it's more in the line of one being very effective and efficient at the same time so yeah. uh and you've talked, you've talked about having factors not being in into your major control so how do you navigate that you don't have much control in some of those areas how yeah. do you mainly navigate those kind of challenges yeah i think uh as we there's there's two parts of it right i think if we look at the macro scale of things it's really about the environment that you work with uh, a lot of the people when we're working in sort of a corporate job um i believe at one point of time we will actually get quite stagnant and comfortable with the things that we're doing as well as making it a routine right so this is an amalgamation of different sort of things that are going on right it could be your experiences that actually allowed you to be functioning at a level where you could sort of autopilot it could also be that you know the job that has been set up for you the environment that's been set up for you is supposed to be a a uh, relatively mundane sort of job or relatively sort of um easy sort of job scope that will allow you to sort of cruise through the entire day right and that sort of constitutes stability in terms of work but then when you're working on a really huge and there's a lot of when you're working on a project that has a lot of moving parts and it becomes really huge just a lot of people that are involved there's people that you know that are involved there, but there's also people that you didn't know that were actually involved then I think the core principle that you should uptake or upkeep is really being comfortable um uh, of not being comfortable right being comfortable of being uncomfortable will really be a trait that will actually help you become more effective and efficient I love the things that we're doing uh on Mercedes Benz on Teamax a lot of the things that we're doing there's a lot of assumptions that we will actually have to make because we don't have the complete information and there will never be a point where you could tell everybody safely that you have the complete information even though you probably have 99% of it right but there's always this undiscovered unknown 1% of the area that might be critical <laughs> that will mm-hmm. actually sort of break uh you know just make or break the entire project right so you need to be really comfortable with making um decisions and making sort of uh and and taking actions based on assumptions being really uncomfortable with the situation is something that you would have to get accustomed with so that is really how uh i think it will it will help you in terms of uh, being a sort of global better sort of project manager or being more effective and efficient at your work right that it has to be in such a way then time back to the end i think uh the, the sort of ways of working in an environment that we have right now is really against the norm uh, of a lot of corporate jobs is because as per how the context that I've actually said a lot of people coming into the job you know the job scopes don't change that much unless you have a career change unless you have a jump in terms of a different environment or a change of environment or a change of specialization right but if you're specializing in certain areas you get up to a point where you actually have a plateau and everything becomes sort of autopilot and cruised uh but on a global project as such yeah it becomes very hard to sort of uh, have that luxury of being of uh sort of retaining uh, or making the job that you do into a routine right and the best way for you to sort of adjust and accustom to this is really just being comfortable and uh in not being uh in being uncomfortable with the projects or your environment so it's more getting uh, more getting used to being in in uh, in in an environment that you have less control with more like yeah. getting comfortable with the gray area of things yeah so that is just one That's element true. of uh other elements you've highlighted what about if we're looking in terms of uh, of esse- essentials of a successful global project what would you determine as those essentials I think there's always the hard skill part of things which is understanding your vertical understanding your uh domain right being sort of the domain expert uh you know it's not always required uh it's not always required from a project manager to be the domain expert you don't have to be the subject matter expert but being the expert of things or being slightly more knowledgeable in the sense understanding your requirements really really well would actually give you an upper hand in terms of uh, you know being a successful project manager but that's on the hard skill side of things right on being on the soft skill side of, side of things which is something that i think i feel like everybody could actually pick up and could actually sort of uh, invest in to actually get better at is to be um is to sorry I sort of lost my train of thought there um but the soft skill side of things uh, i feel that i feel like everybody could actually pick up is being able to sort of uh 
make mistakes without being afraid, so not being afraid to make mistakes, right? Because the thing is that in global projects uh, with so many moving pieces, with so many sort of uh, dependencies, assumptions that we have to make, a lot of people, a lot of times, progress are being stopped. Uh, the, the core of the reason why projects are being stopped or prog- uh, projects are not progressing is really down to just two key reasons. The first key reason is because you don't know how to do it. The second key reason is because you don't understand, right? You don't actually, um, you you just can't function, right? Because everything that you've been trying to do has been stopped by your fear of making a mistake, right? So the first part of it, the, the two sort of core problems, right? The first core problem is what we call as a blocker, is something that we can't actually we can't actually uh, influence. It might be something that, that others will need to work on. But the second part of it is something that we could actually influence, right? The fear of making a mistake because you're not sure of a lot of things because you can't, you know, take the, the action or you can't actually make the decision to work with an assumption and that stop you from progressing a project. Like a lot of the reasons, a lot of the, a lot of the reasons why projects don't progress is really down to the second reason of things. Because as if if you really think through it, if you progress with, uh, if you actually progress with the project, regardless of actually having all of the information, if I actually continue working with it, if you actually, um, you know, just stop being afraid of making mistakes and just do the things that actually needs to be done, execute the things that it needs to be done. Uh, at the end of the day, you will find an answer to solve the first thing that we were speaking about, right? You will actually come to a point whereby somehow something or somewhere could actually give you an answer to solving all of the blockers that you used to have, right? So the second part of it, which is the fear of making a mistake, would actually be one of the key blockers, I would say, that would actually uh, that we could actually action on and that would actually help us uh, progress in our projects a lot better. Now that you've highlighted out more of the, the, those key areas that, that we can look into, what about you when you were starting off managing global projects? What challenges did you face and how did you navigate them? Right. So the, there's a lot of challenges, honestly, when I, when I think back of it. And I don't have a lot of time to sort of reflect on the journey thus far, right? Mm-hmm. But working on Mercedes-Benz, uh, and I've been on the account for about two and a half years, almost three years now. When I first started off with the project, it was in an area that I did not know anything about. So I had no prior knowledge, like I had no knowledge to website management. I had no knowledge to personalization on the website, personalization outside of the website or personalization of web behaviors. Uh, I didn't have any sort of exposure to us, uh, those domain and those areas, like they were not my specialization. And immediately thrown into the works was expecting me to sort of lead the projects and expecting me to manage the clients, helping the clients sort of resolve any sort of requirements that they might have, expecting me to sort of lead teams who in some sort of ways are experts in the project uh, itself or as well, or at least experts in digital marketing or experts in marketing technology. Um, That's become quite challenging for me, but, um, you know, I sort of, I'm, I'm the kind of person that actually likes to be challenged in a lot of ways. Like if I have a challenge that's been, that's been thrown onto me and something that I sort of held and I just work towards it, uh, I have a really strong uh, sense of competition. So I like to take on a lot of the hard things to do. And I find, uh, I find joy and pride in resolving a lot of the hard questions or the, the challenges that are thrown at me. So the first thing that I actually had is really sort of adjusting the, my mindset to say like, you know, I'm coming in here and I'm coming in here as a beginner, but that doesn't sort of, that, that allows me the allowance that, that actually gives me the allowance to make a lot of mistakes. And that actually gives me the allowance to sort of ask a lot of stupid questions that people don't ask, right? It's because uh, everybody, when you get into a call, when you get into sort of a uh, connect with all of the different stakeholders, everybody would have a level understanding. But as somebody who doesn't know anything about the project, your level of understanding is actually not aligned with all of the other people. Uh, and you would have to ask a lot more questions to actually get uh, gain the knowledge that people has already gained. So just think of it as people, if you're in a race, like people are already starting maybe like 10, 20 steps ahead of you, right? So how do you catch up is really working a lot harder and really sort of doing the dirty work that people does not want to do, right? If somebody's actually walking, you need to be jogging, you need to be sprinting to get ahead or at least get into the same level as to where they are. And that's the sort of first thing that I do is really adjusting my mindset 
And even though I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, I was experienced, right, in the field. Like I have been working in marketing for a good few years now and I've, I've graduated grad school, I've come in, but it's an entirely new environment and adjusting the mindset and so sort of the uh, understanding that you're starting out afresh and being able to sort of act as a sponge and just uh, being able to make those mistakes and asking the stupid questions that you think are stupid questions, uh, that will actually help you a lot, right? And that's, that's probably one of the challenges that I had, which is the knowledge gap in things. So I had to really pick up, um, you know, the, the knowledge, the basic knowledge, the foundational knowledge around the domain, and as well as being able to sort of work harder and picking up on a lot of the new information and synthesizing the new information. So the other sort of challenge that I would have uh, when I was sort of starting out is that how do I synthesize the information? It's not because the information uh, doesn't align with the existing information that I had, right? Like that problem is actually not in place because I didn't have any prior information anyway. I didn't have any prior knowledge anyway. Uh, synthesizing the information that I have comes down to the root cause of, you know, if the data source if or if the source of the information is actually reliable, right? When you're working on a global project, the quickest way for you to get information is through people, not through documentation. It's not through Google searching. Like the quickest way for you to actually get information is to ask somebody about it, right? But then uh, you could have a preferred source of information. You could have one person who's been really knowledgeable. The thing, the thing is that you know, not there's nothing sort of absolute in this, right? The sense there's there's just nothing that's uh, absolute in a sense whereby even if the person that you work with or if the person that you're speaking to is really um it's really knowledgeable in the domain area. But because information changes so quickly within a project, uh with so many different stakeholders, it becomes hard to sort of say, you know, this is gonna be my one tr uh, you know, trusted source of truth right it's just never going to be a sense whereby your source of truth is going to be consistent it's just never going to be a sense whereby your source of truth is going to be absolute right so synthesizing the information comes down to sort of verifying your data sources right and understanding you know the people that you're working with like who would actually hold the latest and true the most truthful information and how do you sort of lock that information in into your information map and sort of register that and understand like this piece is now a fact and then i can move on to sort of piece other things together like that was the second piece of challenge is because there's just too many things coming on at the same time it's okay if you can harmonize all of them it's just that there is always a risk whereby once the harmonization of your information is done uh you will come back to a point and realize that you know it's not the harmonization that gone wrong it's the information source that actually gone wrong right and then you have to rejig everything that's in your brain and sort of rework with the information uh you know that overrides uh due to the situation or due to the circumstances quite interesting so i see that uh, knowledge gap was quite the challenge so from switching from the pr side of things and more into a marketing technology environment so how was your mindset in that transition? How did you feel like? That, that, tra that transition was fine. So it, come, it comes back to sort of my life story that I tell every interviewer uh, whenever I'm speaking to anyone. Uh, really, the, when I started off PR, I had always thought that, you know, I'm going to be a PR practitioner for the rest of my life because I felt like I was, it, was, it came really naturally. But everything just came really naturally to me in a sense whereby everything that was thrown at me it just made sense you know information that came to me uh of course a lot of this would be credits to the institution the people the educational people you know the lecturers that actually make sense of all the information but everything to me became an instant click right it's like it's like a piece of puzzle that fits really well within my brain and just says like if that's a new information if it, there's a new piece of puzzle that comes in it just sits there and it's per it's a perfect cutout of things i didn't have to struggle with absorbing any of the information at all right um so that was something that i thought was really it, it motivated me uh in a sense whereby i i sort of foresaw my entire career in public relations because i thought I, i'm naturally born for this where everything makes sense everything that i do from an internship and exposure level in my job uh, i felt like you know, everything just came really easy to me and that was that was a a really good feeling right 
And then, of course, I went into a an advertising agency, <laughs> and and all of the knowledge that I probably, uh, or all of the sort of impression that I built up just got shattered, right? Because the advertising side of things has been so much more interesting than what public relations actually is. Public relations is great, is because you know you you sort of try to influence uh you know mass information, you sort of try to influence a lot of uh, mass decisions or impressions on a massive scale. Right, uh, but the thing is that the limitations is, or the limitation of the industry back then, is that all of this has to be earned. You can't actually pay for any of this, and that's the biggest caveat between public relations and advertising, right? Or everything beyond advertising as well. And so, when once I've, you've gotten into advertising, when you see the dollar amount that comes in, and understood that you know now there's another element that you can actually play with. Like you can't, you don't have to limit yourself to just uh, news factors. You don't have to limit yourself to just the creativity of a certain campaign. But then you could now also look into the area of media buying, right? And how do you strategize against? Media buying and channels, and that just sort of opened an entirely new world for me. And then I decided, like you know, that PR is really not my thing, right? Advertising was my thing. And then after this, like every everything is just sort of just accumulated. And then of course, there's the new extension of things, which uh, is the marketing technology side of things. And once marketing technology came in, together with the different building blocks that we we're just speaking about, the entire world just became a sort of free canvas for me. And I just look at it and I say, like, you know, I'm just going to use whatever color that I have, whatever ingredient that I have. And I'm just going to paint whatever picture that you know looks to <laughs> looks good to me, right? Because I, I have so many ingredients to work with, and I just want to get my hands dirty in all of this. So that was really how it came to be about. So we sort of put this into the perspective of a transition. It didn't so much feel like a transition. It felt like a growth. It felt like a journey. Where I'm just sort of collecting all of the different things across, and then piecing them together, and then of course moving on in the journey, just looking for things that I can continue collecting and continue utilizing all of them. Quite interesting. At least it's good to see that the the transition was exciting for you, and you found that marketing is much more interesting than PR. So yeah, it is. <laughs> so so as we shift back into project management. Uh, what what myths do you do find in global project management, and could you debunk those myths? That's a very hard question, actually. Um, I think everybody has, or every sort of industry has a different understanding of what a project manager should be or could be. And a lot of the people, um, you know, in other industries that I know, right? If you're talking about interior design, for example, if you're talking about software engineering, proper software engineering, project management, for example, and if we talk about, you know, even even other areas, construction, even if you think about, um, you know, uh, chemical engineering as well, and project management in the um, in the STEM space, right, in the science, technology, uh, and mathematics uh, or econ sort of space. Um, the project managers sort of hold a different, uh, the people hold a different regard to as a project manager and the jurisdiction and the autonomy is very much different from how you look at a marketing project manager or marketing tech project manager, right? Even the project managers that we recruit in our company right now, the responsibilities and the expectations of the project managers are very much quite different. Uh, we'd expect them to sort of be more or acting as sort of more a consultant rather than just a project manager level um, because like we don't sort of look at them as individual project managers that follows a certain toolkit or follows a certain guidance of principle and deploy them onto different projects and set up projects and just have the projects run as per the processes like that's not how we expect project managers to be what our expectation the expectations that we have from project managers needs to be a little bit more strategic it's uh, a little bit more hands-on a little bit more involved in terms of just shape not just shaping up the project but as well as helping to execute on the project or even helping to refine and improve upon the project as well right so the project manager now cuts across into a product owner sort of responsibility it cuts across into scrum master responsibility sometimes it will even cut into a developer sort of responsibility right so the project manager sort of becomes the swiss army knife of a project 
if there is a gap, if there's a certain gap in a project, we're expecting project managers to sort of help fill that gap as well, right? And being that, um, you know, just being really flexible and being sort of really universal towards a project rather than just acting as a project manager alone and fulfilling a project management function. So that's the comparison that I have. I think the one myth that uh, I would sort of say has been proven to de be debunked is that um, the project managers will sort of need to follow a specific set of uh, tools or guidance in place, right? I think a lot of the understanding uh, in the industry and in, in, you know, in just the professional career is that a project manager needs to understand the industry standard of how project management should be. So one of the examples would be using an agile ways of working, right? How do you sort of run sprints? How do you sort of have, uh, you know, how do you sort of have sprint events? How do you sort of have sprint backlog? And really sort of living uh, by the guidelines that were set out by different people or different institutions to sort of help uh, badge yourself as a project manager, but really function as an effective project manager. I think that is uh, to me a myth because a project manager, the reason why a project manager is brought into a project, of course, is to help sort of uh, manage the project and progress upon the project. And that is the core function of a project manager, right? Uh, whatever sort of process that you have, whatever sort of uh, toolkit that you have is a collateral to that. And as, as long as the project manager can help to progress on the project, make progress on the projects, then I would say their functionalities are a lot, are, are really deliberate in that sense. And in order for you to make progress on the project, that's, you don't have to adhere um, strictly to a set of guidance or a set of toolkits that, uh, that the industry defines for you, right? It's really up to the project manager themselves to define the impact that they would like to make on the project and how they would like to make that happen. This sort of relates back to my interest in terms of knowing the why and how of things, right? And so with, with and how this correlates with how I work is that I don't necessarily tell project managers like, you know, you need to do agile, right? Or you need to do safe or you need to do something else. Like I don't tell them like, you know, there's a certain principle that you would have to follow. I like to see what they make out of it but on their own. And then I like to understand it, understand uh, why did they choose a certain methodology to do something and how did that actually affect them or how did that actually help them in terms of the project right? It's quite true because uh, there's been quite the belief around that Agile is the way to do all projects. And I've found that it is Agile principles that may work, but not necessarily taking yep. the whole Agile in, its, in itself into exactly. running a project. Yeah. So the, the thing about that is that um, the, the entire core principle around Agile is that there's a process it becomes easier for everybody to understand and follow the process. Uh, but the core output that you would need to have is reiteration, right? It's looking at different iterations in place. It's looking at incremental improvements that you have on the project, right? And if you really distill that and hold true to it, you don't necessarily need an agile framework in place to actually make those happen, right? You could actually use a lot of different sort of ways. You can work out a bespoke sort of process with different team members. As long as it's manageable by you as a project manager, as long as it works for the stakeholders that you're working with, and as long as sort of you deliver on incremental improvements and incremental uh, or iterations of the work and output that you need to do, it's still a sort of project management function, right? It's still an agile uh, principle or mindset that you're actually appearing to. And yeah, there's just no absolute in all of this. Like you don't have to absolutely follow the toolkit. You don't have to, have to absolutely follow the framework. You could really just take it, you know, just sort of deconstruct it and then use it on, uh, just paint it on a canvas, however you like to do it. True, true. So as we look at also in terms of talked a little bit about the successes and talked about also in terms of the essentials for a project to be successful. So to your point of view, why why do you think a global some global projects fail and how can this be mitigated? Sure. I think uh, a lot of the reasons to sort of already preface them early in the conversation. So a lot of reasons why global projects fail is because there's been too many stakeholders that are involved. 
um, you know, I read it somewhere before, but uh, I think one of the things that, that it was said is that the best sort of team size for you to work around is to have six people within the team, right? And six people driving a certain project. Um, and that's including all the stakeholders that you work, and that will give you sort of the maximum effect of uh, having a productive and consistent team. If I'm not mistaken, I think it should be one of the principles from Susan Whelan, but uh, I might need to check my facts against that. But coming back to what I was saying, I think uh, outside of the team size of six, then it becomes hard for you to sort of manage. If you have a seven plus team, or if you have a seven plus sort of project team that you're working with, then, you know, all of the frameworks need to be in place. Your understandings, your knowledge levels need to be sort of level with everyone so that everybody knows what everybody's working on and everybody can be on the same page on a project so that you can progress further alongside, right? So with a global project in place, there's so many different stakeholders, stakeholder parties and stakeholders themselves that are actually looking onto the project, right? That is the first factor of things. There's just too many people involved. But then as well, there's also too many handovers that are actually within the project project itself, right? You can't influence or mitigate or you can't sort of avoid the fact that people are going to come and join and leave the project midway. There's just not going to be continuity end to end, right? There's just not going to be somebody who started the project and going to finish the project at the end of it, especially if you're looking at sort of high effort projects. So if you're looking at migrations, for example, if you're looking at rollouts, for example, any sort of high effort projects that would take you maybe nine months to a year or even beyond for you to actually complete, it's going to be really hard for you to have someone see it end to end or even the person that's been leading or sponsoring the project might not even be there at the end of the project so the stakeholders the handover points uh but coupled with a lot of the things that we talked about which is people don't really understanding what should they what they should be doing within the project and as well as uh you know just paired with the fear of making mistakes uh in terms of trying to progress on the mistake uh, on the projects itself right all these four different points uh, sort of coupled together you could just imagine like the projects would sort of just be in a stalemate it would just be paralyzed in a lot of sense because of these combination of different factors right and so it's not, I wouldn't say it's entirely just the project manager's responsibility to sort of help mitigate all of this, but I guess it's really sort of a teamwork in place, right? I can't pinpoint to say like the project managers need to be the know-all of the entire project, right? But what if your project manager leaves, right? Or then you would tell me, of course, let's do a handover, but a handover from a project manager to a project manager, uh, as, as, you know, as much as you would like to document, if you're a documentation master expert, and you could document all the nuance and all of the contextual knowledge that you have, uh, I would say you would still miss out a good chunk of it, right? Because there's a lot of things that you can't actually put in paper, right? There's a lot of things that, there's a lot of sort of, there's, there's things like sentiments, for example, there's things like um, nuances or sort of complexities in place or even people relationship that you can't actually put it on paper, right? You can't say, oh, A works well with B, but then A wouldn't work well with C. Like you just can't transfer a lot of this knowledge without actually working with a person extensively, right? Documentations can't help you in all of this. And so all of these things just sort of bundle up together will really sort of be the core reasons as to why projects don't progress and projects don't stop. Uh, again, a lot of what I look at and why, what I focus on is really on the soft skill side of things, because it's, if there's a hard skill side of things that's becoming your blocker, then it's an easier solution because it's definitely somebody that would actually have an answer, right? Within your entire, uh, within your entire project team and the stakeholders that you work with, if it's not your core team that has the answers to the information that you need, it would be an extended team. It would be a sponsored team that would actually be able to find an expert, or you could actually go out into the free market and sort of, you know, post your problem statement and find somebody to actually solve your problems, right? So the hard skill side of things, there's definitely going to be an answer for. It. It's just the soft skill side, uh, soft third side of things, right? The soft skill requirement side of this, and the people management side of this, uh, that's going to be really crucial for your projects to function or for your projects to actually uh, be delivered according to the timelines that you've set. Quite interesting. Quite interesting. At least we've get, got an at least an understanding of the different things to keep into consideration. But what I see key is uh, you're you're looking for more of people over process. That is 
yeah. involvement of person to person kind of communication person to person kind of uh, engagements right over and above documentation because i know yes we all have documents but 80 percent of the chance we're not sure if people read them fully and if it's a project that is fast the movie we need uh time to to digest all that information and it's easier to digest them when you just listen to someone presenting it over to just, you. yeah just just speaking on top of that right i think documentations are great right you can't you can't have a project sort of being turned around without having any documentations but if you just think about the effort that's needed not just to write the documentations but the efforts that are needed to actually read through the documentations and adjust the document and absorb the information on the documentation if somebody spends 20 hours writing the documentation you will likely have to spend an additional 20 hours just reading and digesting the information that's 40 hours that you're spending right uh, of a resource uh, that's 40 hours that you're sort of um, utilizing from the entire project team just on sort of understanding or having the same level of understanding being on the same page uh, before you could actually function on a project and that's actually a lot of time and resources that you're using right just to get yourself up to speed and so a lot of people like a lot of projects they would actually skimp on this and this is why the most effective way is actually for you to sort of do uh, meetings, right? Doing knowledge transfers that you have from team to team, from people to people. That's the most effective, uh, sorry, that's the most efficient way, but sometimes not necessarily the most effective ways of things, right? Just looking at the entire sort of landscape and the entire overall uh, holistic approach of things. Makes sense, makes sense. So. If we're to do more of a reflective study on yourself, what would be the best advice you'd give your 19-year-old self? Uh, that's a tough one. Speaking to my 19-year-old self, I'm just thinking about what are the things that I was doing when I was 19. I think I was just like fooling around uh, and higher. No, that's university, yeah. But I think the most... I think the advice that I would actually give myself is to continue my course and do the things that I've been doing. But if there is one thing that I would have changed, and I sort of thought about this quite a bit, uh, is that I might not actually have dwelled into the public relations course or mass communications or uh, you know marketing or advertising or anything to do with this kind of favor, right? Mass communication as a whole. Uh, is something that you know I shouldn't have actually studied. Uh, you know, I might, uh, if if I were to, I, I would be able to sort of be to make a new decision when based on when I'm, I'm 19. I think one of the areas that I would actually focus on is maybe on econs or maybe even doing finance. Because working with, as, as you sort of work in the industry and you realize that, you know, there's a lot of great tools that are out there, right? There's a lot of great uh, platforms that are out there that would actually allow you to do your job a lot more uh, better. But all of it comes down to the, the, if you distill all of it, the tools and the platforms comes down to just one thing, right? Which is the Excel function. And being able to sort of extensively work on Excel, being able to be the masters of Excel, Will really help you progress in your career it doesn't matter what you're doing right and that's just uh something that i would believe right based on the experiences that i had and based on the challenges that i've sort of um you know endured i just feel like if a candidate or if talent uh has extensive knowledge in excel like your world is so much more better compared to others is because with an excel you could do so much more like you know you have so many functions within excel like i'm not an excel expert i really just use the foundational uh, elements within an excel uh, i try to sort of pick up as much as i go but uh it's gonna be a, an uphill battle for me if you already have extensive knowledge in excel and you already know how to use excel it just becomes a lot easier for you to sort of uh you know to sort of work on data but the most important part of things is that it becomes a lot uh, it, it helps you in a sense to organize your information, right? Because in an Excel table, like you could do it how Excel sheet, you could actually do it however you want. 
but if you're thinking you know three steps ahead or four steps ahead you need to think about how do you sort of organize your information is it going to be in a table form is it going to be structured in such a way like what is going to be a y-axis what is going to be your x-axis like what is going to be a z-axis for example how do you sort of correlate all of this and the organization of that information or the organization of your data is going to be very crucial right for you to actually plan out uh, things to actually get insights or information that you need to have and that is the beauty of being uh, an expert in an excel is because you know the functionality and the limits that you sort of have to pre-plan yourself uh, and sort of have to plan strategically as to how do you sort of map certain data and how do you want your tables to look like and that's i think that's going to be a transferable skill uh, in terms of strategic planning in terms of you know how do you uh, in terms of all the things that you're going to do if you're going to be in marketing technology if you're going to be marketing or working in a digital agency right it's just going to be a really good advantage for you to have which uh honestly is something that i do not have right now so if i were to tell something to my 19 year old self or give myself an advice i would say you know I'll start picking up and learning the fundamentals of excel learn the advanced uh you know usages of excel try to look at more use cases try to look at the usage of it and try to see how people sort of creatively use these functions in place to actually deliver something that's out of the box i think having those sort of exposures and looking through those case studies or use cases are going to be really beneficial for you as you move forward in the future and sort of strategize or ideate different uh, solutions in place so that is bye bye to PR if it was a 19 year old you. Yeah. <laughs> so if we look at it in a futuristic sense, what would be, how would you like to be remembered? How would I like to be remembered? I think in the agency, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who's been really good at their job for us in my career. I just like to be, I think, we spoke about being efficient. We spoke about being effective. As I come from a project management background, um, you know, those are the things that I sort of, uh, I pivot myself to it. But then there's also the last part of it, which is being impactful, right? And impactful is sort of, it, it's such a broad word, right? There's so many things that you could actually do to be impactful. There's so many areas that you could actually uh, influence that would actually allow you to be impactful, right? You could be impactful in the financial sense. You can be impactful in a people organizational sense. Uh, there's just so many different domains and areas that you can actually be impactful. But I think uh, that's the one thing that I want to be remembered for, right? Like I could be helpful, like I could be effective, I could be efficient. But I think above all of this, being impactful is it's going to be really important for me. Is because I like to go into a situation. I like to go into a meeting, understanding your uh, your problem and giving you a solution, right? Or at least giving you a head start to finding a solution, right? That's being impactful. I like to go into your project and helping you deliver this uh, in a more efficient sense, in a more effective sense, and that's being impactful to you, right? As a sponsor of a project, or like to go into a certain problem and helping you find solutions, or if not inspire you, at least try to inspire you to look at things from a different perspective and being able to find solutions from there on out that's being impactful to someone or best being impactful to something right and i think just being remembered as being an impactful person uh doesn't matter if it's from professional sense or even from a personal sense like having a good impact onto someone uh i think that's that's really how i like my legacy to be written that's, that's great so you're looking more to be as someone who with a high level of impact on people's lives, whether on a professional level. Yeah. That's true. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, as it has really been a nice conversation having it with you, but I would like to know what would be your final remarks as we wind up this conversation. We spoke about a lot of things. Um, I think if we sort of scale it back down to really project management and managing global projects, I would say 
project management is really not as dull and not as boring as people would think it would be. A lot of people, exactly what you said, right? I think a lot of people would actually think that project management is process over people first. But I think, uh, again, it comes down to how you look at things and what are the values that you want to uphold and upkeep, right? Uh, I choose to be a person that takes people over processes and really looking at the people factor of things rather than process factor of things because those are things that, you know, of course, they would make an impact, right? Uh, but those are things that are, I feel like those are easy areas for you to find solution to it. It's just the complex areas for you to find solution to us would be the people management of things. And that's, but that's also an interesting part of things is because, you know, as I sort of told you, I'm the kind of person where if you have a, a you know, a challenging situation for me, I'm the one that gets really excited and, you know, would like to, of course, jump on it and try to find solutions. So this is why I lean more towards the complex side of things and I lean more towards, you know, being able to sort of help straighten all of this out, being effective, efficient, and being impactful to its office, right? But coming back to what I was saying as a final remark, project management as a space is really, um, it's really interesting and it's ever evolving. Agile is just a, it's sort of just a uh, milestone to how project management is actually evolving to it. And with the enablement of technology, there's so many things that you can actually do, right? If you think about agile mindset, it was set up, I don't know, 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, or around sort of that pop up. It was actually created about 10 to 15 years ago, if, uh, if I still remember my facts correctly, right? And we're still upholding the agile mindset and principle up to this day as we talk about project management, right? And I think about the potential areas for you to grow out of being agile. That's just so much more because this 10 to 15 years surplus of 10 to 15 years worth of technology that's actually came into play and different use cases that everybody has been seeing on a day-to-day -day basis that would actually change how you do project management, right? And absorbing all of those and being able to sort of utilize them and strategize around how you would be if an effective project manager and as well as an efficient and impactful project manager is going to be this, the sort of mission for a lot of the up and coming project managers, right? That's going to be the calling for you if you're really interested in a space and it doesn't have to be mundane. It doesn't have to be dull. You're working with uh, a lot of people. You're touching base with a lot of different experts. You're touching base with a lot of different stakeholders and that will hopefully feed more into the informational map that you're actually conjuring. And of course, that's going to feed, that's going to help you sort of, uh, as, as there's more data points that are coming in, it's going to be more helpful for you to sort of think about solutions uh, using all of these data points, using all of these data to sort of help uh, resolve project issues or resolve project blockers in a more effective manner. So all I want to say is that project management is interesting. I don't see myself getting out of project management in any of the short or midterm. I feel like I'm going to dwell in this space for quite a long time and thinking about how do you sort of bridge the different functionalities within the project, right? You have the strategizing pe uh, piece of people, you have the development piece of people, you have the project management side of things. Uh, how do you sort of, you know, really just be cross uh, functional in the sense and having everybody come to the table together Right. Project managers don't have to just be project managers. Developers don't have to just be developers and strategists doesn't have to just be strategists, right? And how does everybody sort of become in some sort of ways, uh, not so much being a generalist, but being more comprehensive and being more sophisticated in that sense. And how does everybody sort of holistically upskill themselves so that the entire project team just becomes stronger? Uh, that's something that, you know, I'm very much focused on and I feel like, you know, people should actually have a look into. Wow, that's a very loaded answer. Uh, really, really loaded. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for really being a guest on the Wow Factor podcast. It has really been a nice conversation with you of at least touched more on your personal life and as well as going through uh, global projects uh, intensely. So I'm um, really I really am hopeful and I'm, I'm glad. I believe that all the, anyone that listens to this conversation is going to be really well beefed up with enough knowledge that they'll be able to manage their global projects at scale. So thank you so much, Johan, for being a guest on the War Factor podcast. No worries. Thank you very much, Samuel, for inviting me as well. Pleasure is all mine. Have a great day. You too. Speak to you soon. Speak soon.